Well, good evening. Uh, one thing that uh, Zoom and YouTube has forced upon us is the virtue of punctuality. Uh, and we will begin within a few minutes of the announced starting time, which I think is a, a healthy development in our community. So uh, we'll proceed. Uh, anyway, good evening. My name is Mark Mamagonian. For those of you who are watching on YouTube and don't know, I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Uh, greetings both to the audience here in the room at Nasser and those watching online. However you may be joining us tonight, thanks for making the time. Like all of you, for the past 10 days or so, since Armenia was attacked by Azerbaijan's military forces, everything we're doing here uh, is with this grave reality in our minds, whether it's in the forefront of our thoughts or if we manage to push it onto the back burner for some time, so to speak, for a portion of the day, but it's always there. So above all, our thoughts are with those who are either literally at the front lines or in close proximity, which means the entire country, the entire Republic of Armenia. When I first heard from Karni Kerkonian, from whom we shall hear presently, suggesting the possibility of our hosting tonight's program, it was very obvious that it was a timely and necessary event for us to do. That was before September 13th. The attack that took place at that time didn't make the topic of enforcing international law any less relevant, to say the least. On the contrary, the case of the Republic of Armenia versus Azerbaijan, which went before the International Court of Justice last year, arguing that Azerbaijan had violated international, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, and the court's decision about which we shall hear from our speaker tonight, took on a, Gave, gave the topic an added importance in light of the events of the past 10 days. This, at least, is my opinion, which is that of an observer, not an authority on international law. But tonight's program is another example of the type of program on contemporary issues that Nasser has done an increased number over the past five or seven years, seeing the need to integrate high-caliber, fact-based discussions of current issues into our long, more than 65 year history of presenting authoritative scholarly talks on a multitude of subjects comprising our expansive vision of Armenian studies. I would like now to invite, uh, actually, excuse me, I would like to make a couple of brief announcements. Uh, this uh, next week on Monday, September 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern, we invite you to join us and the organizers and co-sponsors for uh, a webinar, a conversation with Dr. Dennis Papazian, reflecting on the past, looking to the future. Uh, you can find details about this and all these programs on our website. One week from tonight, at the same time and in the same place, invite you to a hybrid event with Dr. Anna Ohanian, The Neighborhood Effect, The Imperial Roots of Regional Fracture in Eurasia. This is Professor Ohanian's new book. She's in the room tonight. If you want a sneak preview, you can ask her about it afterwards. But better yet, come on uh, out next Thursday to hear her speak in person. On Saturday, October 1st at 10.30 a.m. here at Nasser, there will be a children's book event, a live storytelling of Lazarus Arayan's story, Anahit, given in Eastern and Western Armenian. And finally, uh, on October 2nd, we ask you to join us for another webinar with Dr. Roy Naki on Fritov Nansen, Humanitarianism and the Armenian Question in the Interwar Period. There's a lot of other things coming up in the fall beyond that. I will not tax you with more information now. But I would like to invite Carney Kirkonian to come and speak and offer introductory remarks. Carney is an international lawyer and professor of international law who serves on the Armenian delegation to the International Court of Justice, and really, it is his, through, through his kind offices that we're here tonight. Please welcome him. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's nice to be able to walk up to a microphone that's properly situated, right? <laughs> um, I think I'd like to start by saying, um, just a few days ago, a video was circulated on social media. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. 
It's of a dead Armenian woman, her finger cut and put into her mouth, her body mutilated, across her barren chest, extremist words chiseled into her skin. Her eyes were gouged out of her head and rocks were put in them. She was a young Armenian mother. For many, this image, this image alone draws immediate parallels to the denuded and desecrated bodies of, uh, that we witnessed at the Armenian, in, during the Armenian genocide, the cruelty and the hatred. The state-sponsored ethnic hatred against the Armenian people. A century later, it remains a reality. On the heels of genocide recognition, we have ethnic cleansing, we have ethnic hatred again. For us Armenians, it doesn't seem to be never again. How do we deal with such hatred? How do we tackle acts of deprivation and inhumanity? How do these acts translate into the fabric of international law, actionable fabric of international law? We have been struggling with this epic question for generations. And our speaker today has explored this topic in real time, in pressing real time. When I first met my colleague, he was speaking in Paris. It was 2015, and he was speaking on the law of reparations for genocide under international law. Today, his work is at the forefront of the Armenian state's legal efforts, frankly, to prevent another genocide. Yeri Shegiragosyan is a unique find. He's a thinker, a lawyer, an academic, a colleague, and a friend. He received his LLB from Yerevan State University as well as his PhD from Yerevan State University. He holds an LLM in International Legal Studies from Georgetown University and a Master of Science of Law from Stanford University. He has held many positions within the Armenian government as advisor to the Prime Minister uh, in various capacities. He has held teaching positions and continues to hold teaching positions at Yerevan State University and the American University of Armenia. He has taught at the Slavonic University, University as well as the French Armenian University in Yerevan. He comes today in another capacity, in the capacity that, is, that he has held for the last several years, and an important one, almost a historic one. I shouldn't say even almost, it is a historic one and that is as the agent of the Republic of Armenia to the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Giragosyan to address. Thank you, uh, uh, Karnik. Uh, thank you for kind words and introduction. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll try to uh, provide a good summary of, of the work that I've been, my office uh, and the team uh, behind it uh, is doing uh, in this front. And um, you know that unfortunately because of the war and because of the continuous efforts of Azerbaijan to intimidate Armenia, to threaten Armenia and to uh, the aggressive um, actions taken against the territory of Armenia uh, are uh, still uh, urging and then re-emphasizing the necessity of uh, using these international legal tools and resorting to the court and trying to enforce it. And um, it, is, it, it has been a very um, active uh, timing in the past couple of years in, in, the, in this regard specifically. Um, and uh, for me professionally too because uh, what, what Armenia is trying to do now through using this in the different international legal tools, courts, Armenia is simply trying to enforce uh, international law as it is. And uh, it's hard, it's highly challenging. And in the course of this enforcement exercise, in the course of, in, on, this, on a way 
we face many challenges and uh, we're trying to overcome those, of course. Uh, just in two words, what has been done so far and what is being done uh, by, by the Republic of Armenia in, in this direction. Uh, right after uh, the end of the 44-day uh, war, in, in a matter of months, we uh, filed uh, uh, the first ever interstate application claim by the Republic of Armenia against Azerbaijan at the European Court of Human Rights. The, that was the first initial application which was relating to uh, the massive violations of human rights, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and uh, grave breaches of Geneva Convention and other violations of international instruments uh, during the 44-day war and also in the immediate aftermath of that war, December, January. And uh, we have uh, also in, in the follow-up submitted two more applications to the European Court of Human Rights, which are relating to several other scopes, which unfortunately happened after the war ended, you know that. And the part of, uh, there is the second application which relates to the rights uh, of the uh, POWs and Armenian captives, which were undergoing uh, sham trials in Baku, which was completely uh, in violation of fair trial guarantees, uh, flagrant denial of justice. And uh, there is also an application relating to events that unfolded uh, earlier this year in Artsakh, uh, the villages Paruch and Karagluk, where Azerbaijani uh, armed forces were <clears throat> forced uh, the villagers to flee the, the ethnic cleansing and of course the gas disruptions and intimidations of the civilian population living in the villages using uh, the recorded uh, intimidating message and uh, threatening messages and psychological pressure. The, uh, uh, the work continues so far and the European Court is, uh, is a uh, and apart from that, of course, th those are the main interstate applications that have been submitted to the court. But apart from these main proceedings, uh, starting from the very beginning of the war in 2020, uh, the, we have been continuously, and we continue to do that, we have been filing uh, so-called interim measure request at the court, which means that uh, uh, we request the court to act immediately in certain uh, instances when it is necessary to preserve the life uh, of a person that is uh, that finds himself or herself under the authority of Azerbaijani forces and agents. And we particularly stressed the necessity uh, for the court to act because, as said, uh, unfortunately in Azerbaijan we have this high degree of an, uh, vo an high volume of hatred and animosity towards ethnic Armenians, which have been, which has been, I think, meticulously and very systematically uh, structured and over the decades, but especially over the past decades, it has been there. But I think it has been taken to another level by 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 Ilham Aliyev for the past decades. And that made, makes any, like even the existence or the presence of an ethnic Armenian in Azerbaijan, a life threatening directly. It's, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, we keep asking the court when, when, a, when a POW appears under the Azerbaijani rule authority or a captive, civilian captive, doesn't matter. We directly ask the court to apply the interim measures, which is a, an urgent measure uh, the court passes a decision and obliges Azerbaijan to abide by those decisions, of course. Not, it's not all the, all, all the time, unfortunately, that or it happens so very often that Azerbaijan is not in, in compliance with the rulings of the court, unfortunately. We have witnessed cases when uh, even, even, even after applying of the interim measure requests and decisions by the court, they were disregarded and disregarded uh, gravely, especially um, relates also to the recent event. And we unfortunately, we had cases of uh, uh, POWs and captives being killed, even though uh, there has been uh, very clear and direct evidence 
showing that a person was under the authority of Azerbaijan agents. And based on that video, we have applied to the court, and the court has had uh, passed a decision and uh, set a time limit for Azerbaijan to reply and provide information about whereabouts and the conditions of detention and the health conditions. But we have had cases of violation of such. So this is, this is highly cynical. I know it sounds very cynical, and it is. Unfortunately, that's the, that's the country that we are dealing with. It's highly cynical, uh, racist, uh, autocracy, or no, it's like a dictatorship more directly. And uh, that's, that makes even uh, the, the enforcement of the international, of course, harder. And that's, that's proven. Uh, but in any case, I think it doesn't matter. The, uh, we, we continue pursuing this path. The European Court is not the only international legal mechanism that our Armenia has triggered. Um, the, um, we um, uh, have filed uh, an application instituting proceedings at the ICJ, International Court of Justice, which is the uh, main uh, body of the United Nations, judicial body of the United Nations, and the application instituting proceedings at the International Court of Justice is based specifically on the International Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. That's the scope and the basis of the on which this application was uh, filed at the court. And you remember that uh, if you have been following the events last year, the filing of the application, we have had hearings in The Hague. And similarly, uh, simultaneously filing the application, we filed also the request to indicate uh, provisional measures, to uh, urgent provisional measures, to preserve the rights under the convention until the court adjudicates the application, because that will take Unfortunately, it will take some longer time because the legal proceedings are taking time, and it will take years until the final adjudication of the uh, dispute, uh, which uh, means that we will be having this legal proceedings live at, for the several uh, years to come. And uh, the, 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 the highlight of this filing and the highlights of these proceedings were the hearings, of course, where Armenia presented uh, through uh, the agent, also through the council team, uh, the arguments that are uh, uh, underlying the claims and the request for provisional measures. And just reminding you that the request of provisional measures was uh, relating to the treatment of the POWs and captives that are under the authority of Azerbaijan. It was relating to the preservation of cultural, Armenian cultural property under the, in the, on the territories under the authority and control of Azerbaijan. It was relating to uh, uh, the um, military trophies park. Uh, and uh, we had also uh, the, the main, the central, one of the central requests was about the uh, uh, termination of the hate speech by, including by public officials, including by high-ranking public officials. Unfortunately, because we, you know, the, uh, and when you just follow the rhetoric by the high-ranking officials, the president himself, and uh, the, all the levels of the government institutions, their, their, their rhetoric, their speech always has a racist and armenophobic element in that, that you can't, you, you cannot see any speech by the president that doesn't address or like use some um, uh, abusive uh, words, abusive statements relating to Armenia, to ethnic Armenians, and uh, just trying to perpetuate that thread of hatred in the society. And uh, uh, fortunately, the court, I think the, the evidentiary uh, materials provided to the court were of such, uh, I think, persuasive uh, character that the court indicated the measures and the court actually granted most of the requests that we were requesting the court to grant. And the court granted the, uh, uh, the, the, the measure relating to the uh, termination of the hate speech by public officials 
granted the measure relating to the preservation of the cultural property and vandalism uh, of the cultural property, including churches, cathedrals, artifacts, um, any other cultural property that is of Armenian and is under the control of Azerbaijan, granted the measure relating to the preservation of the rights of uh, persons of ethnic Armenian origin under the authority of Azerbaijan. And um, the uh, and of course the general measure that the court applies in such cases is uh, that the court obliges the, both parties not to take any steps to further aggravate the dispute. And uh, after the decision was out in, on, on December 7, 2021, uh, we have been following up and trying to observe how the decision is being implemented in Azerbaijan. Unfortunately, we have been witnessing many instances, many scenarios where Azerbaijan is flagrantly was in breach, of course, notifying the court about that. It was in February, it was in March, it was in, in, in summer, uh, it was recently in September when we, uh, our Armenia was attacked. Armenia's sovereign and undisputed territory was attacked by Azerbaijan. And uh, the, unfortunately, during this uh, attack, you, uh, we witnessed again, uh, we witnessed again the re repetition of the same, uh, uh, the same trait, which is uh, the capturing of POWs, the horrific treatment, the war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity also, and uh, the gruesome uh, uh, mutilation of dead uh, diseased bodies, which is uh, completely in, in, in contrast with all any, any, any value set or that the international provides today. The problem with Azerbaijan is I think that, and I think in, in, in globally too, and especially the region, it, what I think is happening, uh, we are I think witnessing uh, uh, maybe a little bit of crisis of values today, uh, which also makes the enforcement application of international even more challenging. And, and there is this, uh, not only the values are in crisis, but also the, the governments and the countries or dictatorships like Azerbaijan, they are, I think, they, they are now far away <laughs> from the value set that has been established by the international community. And this is, and also there is this, uh, uh, um, I think it, it is uh, partly also due to the fact that this country is also try to fake that they are being good countries or they are being uh, law-abiding countries under international law, trying to um, mislead the international community, and that happens. I think it's in, over the time this gap between the actual uh, values on paper and the actual how the countries behave is is uh, it's uh, even um, increasing, and it's increasing, and that that makes it really harder. But in any case, what what Armenia is trying to do, Armenia is trying to continuously point out that. Uh, trying to apply the existing principles and norms, and uh, uh, recently, in, after the uh, after the attack by Azerbaijan on September 13th, uh, we submitted two follow-up letters uh, and requesting the court an action. We requested the court. We have been requesting the court to take an action since March this year. We're requesting the court to establish uh, three judges committee to observe the implementation of the order. We haven't heard back from the court and now we are reiterating our request and we are also asking the court, considering the given situation and considering that the treatment of the POWs and captives continues to be worrying and in, uh, in stark uh, like a violation of the international provisions, we're requesting the court to amend uh, the uh, already uh, existing order of the court of 7 December 2021 and extend that order to protect the new captives, the new POWs. That's what we are requesting the court. Uh, we hope that we'll be hearing from the court soon because we have been 
also providing uh, all the evidential materials to the court in the past week or so, a bit more than that. We have been really, I think every day uh, we have been conducting the research and we have been watching all the channels, uh, the Telegram channels and other social media platforms where those videos are being circulated mostly and uh, being uh, summarizing them and systematizing and submitting to the courts for the review. And I've been flagging the urgency of the matter by through those videos, trying to prove the point that uh, the courts need to act urgently. Although uh, it is it is taking time, but I think it is, this 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 legal proceedings are important to for uh, for 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 in many respects. I think first of all for keeping the record, for providing uh, and making the voice heard to the international community, especially when those proceedings are public and oral proceedings, especially the one that we had last year, and. We are going to have another hearings, I think, next year uh, with relation to the claims presented by Armenia at the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, public hearings, public uh, discussions are helping to focus the attention of the international community to the issue. That also adds up, um, creates additional uh, pressure mechanism, additional pressure uh, possibility to uh, to pressure Azerbaijan to comply with some uh, commitments, and uh, this is this is in a nutshell what's what's happening in the legal forefront. And of course, we do have claims presented to Azerbaijan against Armenia too, which uh, against which we are presenting our observations and uh, counter arguments and replies. We have been doing that so far, and of course, the tactic that Azerbaijan is using is very simple. What they are doing is they are trying to mirror. Uh, our claims. They are trying to mirror Armenia's steps and that's a way of defending their interests. That's a way that trying to, what they do usually, trying to create an image of a victim, trying to create an image of the victim which is at some point sounds too way too cynical, especially the recent events, when they are uh, claiming that they are the victims of the Armenian aggression, which is so ridiculous. And it relates to many other fields that we receive the claims, and that's uh, that's uh, that's very uh, 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 disturbing at some points because and and and, it, and there's a necessity and need for the Armenian side and for us to also very um, systematically and very um, in a very um, diligent manner to work in this regard because uh, the countries' attempts to falsify the facts is very well known. And Azerbaijan is very, is used as tactics, and Azerbaijan has is, is been using the tactics also in its policies, because you know that um, uh, when we are speaking about the racial discrimination, about the uh, public uh, policies of implanting hatreds against Armenians, it is, um, how it is done is not only done through the uh, statements by the political leadership or the state state apparatus. It is also done by very uh, meticulously structured educational programs at preschool education, school education, where you have very precise messages and uh, images of ethnic Armenians as evil, as negative personality, which creates already the seeds of the hatred from a very young age uh, in, in kids. And that also is uh, presented in the manner that Azerbaijan is trying to invent history and uh, rewrite history and falsify the history. And these attempts, I think, date back to early 20th centuries, if you go back the time. And that's, that has been the case, and now it's, I think in, in the past decades, it has been more and more aggressive in that regard, trying to falsify the history. What they're trying to do, they're trying diligently to erase any Armenian trace on the territories that they control. The traces, meaning the monuments, the uh, Khachkars, cemeteries, and uh, the uh, Armenian culture, artifacts, anything that Armenian is being either erased or uh, falsified or 
uh, altered to present it as as if uh, uh, Albanian so-called or Udi. That's uh, and those 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 tactics are also uh, present not only in the subst- substance but also. Uh, when when we are dealing with uh, in, in the international arena, also when presenting the cases, unfortunately, and we we have been observing that, which means that the work uh, that we do uh, is becoming even more challenging and difficult. But it is not it is not it is not impossible, and uh, the volume of the evidential images that we are now compiling at this point at the ICJ level, the proceedings are uh, in the phase that we are now preparing our main submission, the memorial, which encompasses the arguments uh, army is making and all the most of the evidential materials that we will be presenting to the court. And uh, it's overwhelming. It is overwhelming. And uh, we'll be submitting the time limit for submission to the court is January uh, 2023. And uh, we'll be submitting that, of course. and. Um, that's uh, and I think this case is very is highly important. It's, I would say that this is existential, and uh, for the for the entire nation, and in many respects. And that's why pursuing this case. That's why uh, continuing to uh, present the arguments in the framework of this case is really uh, a key, uh, fundamental and vital for the country. And I th- I, w- I would also say that uh, the legal proceedings that Armenia has initiated are also important um, aspects or important for uh, reinforcing the country's sovereignty in a way. Because in that manner, you, when you voice or when you uh, make use of this international legal tools, uh, Armenia is making the voice heard first. Secondly, Armenia is uh, making a bold step, re-emphasizing its membership of, to the international community and its adherence to the values that has been created or should be govern, governing the international community and should be governing the relations between states. And unfortunately, most of the countries today, or not many countries today, are forgetting about those values or trying to tilt and um, uh, mut- mutilate <laughs> these values, which is, not, which is very sad, but st- Still, I think we need to not forget because those those values are fundamental, and uh, and uh, and the convention that Armenia has brought the case, by the way, based on I mean the convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination is fundamental in this respect because that convention is is one of the first human rights instruments, one of the very uh, fundamental first human rights instruments adopted after the Second World War. Uh, in 1965, and uh, even even prior to the two covenants of 1966, uh, and I think this convention is uh, very tightly and logically connected with the genocide convention. Why? Because, as I said in the beginning, uh, the race, ra- racist uh, policies or racial hatred and animosity that is being the policies that are being targeted at creating ethnic hatred or hate towards certain groups are, are the, uh, uh, they are creating a very favorable atmosphere for commission of uh, crime of genocide and other heinous crimes under international law. And the fruits that we see, the war crimes, crimes against humanity being committed against Armenian soldiers, against uh, Armenian civilian and these policies and those are the fruits of this hatred. Those are direct fruits of those uh, the years and decades long hate uh, propaganda. And uh, I know that that's, uh, I- countries when they go this far, it's very hard for them to change. I mean, they, it's, it's really uh, impossible to change in a day or two or a month or a year. You need to you need to work very diligently in that regard, but still. It's important uh, for for our country to pursue this path because that also makes the country's position even more is more stronger. I think uh, this uh, this is in a nutshell what's uh, what's there at this point. Uh, I think maybe I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. 
and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Please, please stay. stay here. Um, so for those watching on, on Zoom, I think if you use the normal Zoom Q&A function, I think I will be able to pick up the questions and I will uh, address them as, as they are uh, received. And those of you who are in the room, just allow me to, first of all, please try to keep the question short and allow me to restate it <coughs> so that people who are watching can hear. Step on. My question has to do with enforcement. So let's say I'm, I have a lot of confidence that, you know, I've read a lot about the data you've collected and the submissions you're making, the applications. Let's say the court, the European court, for example, rules in favor of Armenia for whatever the injustice is. What enforcement mechanisms? We know Turkey, Azerbaijan, they have a history of ignoring, they're lawless countries. What enforcement mechanisms, are, what, what are the implications of ignoring the ruling of the court? So the question, which is exactly the question I was going to ask, thank you, Stepan, is regarding uh, in, enforcement mm -hmm. or the lack of ability to enforce given the, the scoff law nation, nations mm -hmm. that are involved here. Yeah? Should I answer? Or please. Click, 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 no, please okay. go. Go right ahead. Okay. Good. Uh, the enforcement, uh, uh, formally the enforcement mechanisms, if we are speaking about the European Court of Human Rights judgments, uh, they are, it is the Committee of Ministers per se, which is the political body of the Council of Europe, which is, uh, which has the competence of following up on the execution of the judgments. They hold regular meetings, they receive reports, they oversee the implementation, and the country is obliged to provide periodic updates what's, what's there. And we have, uh, uh, of course, um, as I participate in the meetings of the Committee of Ministers as the agent of the, uh, of the country, there are a number of uh, pending, for example, still uh, cases uh, which are under the supervision of the com com committee, interstate cases, I mean, for example, Georgia versus Russia. Not anymore because uh, Russia is not a member anymore. <laughs> Uh, but it was, and I'm, 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 I mean the discussions that go, and there is also the famous case Cyprus versus Turkey. Uh, that's also the uh, execution of that judgment, which, which uh, although it's quite old, but still they, they continue the discussions. And we have many other judgments that still continue. And I know that this is, and this is not the best mechanism, this is not the most effective mechanism, that I'm, I don't have any, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm a realist. I don't uh, think that uh, I know the shortcomings of this com of this committee because, and I know that uh, Turkey and uh, Azerbaijan are not the countries which will be readily implementing those judgments. Uh, but uh, still, having the judgments there, if we, I think it, it is quite uh, possible because legally speaking, we do have a lot of evidentiary materials, and I think having a judgment that will condemn. Uh, Azerbaijan's violations and confirm us. We already have several individual cases which have been presented to the European Court of Human Rights and we have a number of judgments where the court has confirmed a violation by Azerbaijan. For example, the famous case of Gurgen Markadian, which is Minasian and Magushan versus Azerbaijan and Hungary. And uh, we have the confirmation by the court there, not only the right to violation of right to life, but also the connection they, between the right to life and Article 14, which is the prohibition of discrimination, which is a key here because the killing was done, it uh, was racially motivated killing. And uh, although the, I don't think that they will be, I don't have the very high hopes that they will be implemented, but still, we need to go on with these proceedings because they give a lot of also um, tools, not tools, a lot of, um, I think political, politically they can be used also to add up pressure because if you have number of judgments where you have uh, repeatedly stated the problem in those, in those countries, and which is true. And if we have, for example, the judgments in the interstate cases, if we have judgments in the ICJ, then you have a lot of huge, an array of judgments, which uh, can be very uh, effectively used politically too, because that will also be easily, then will be easier to convince the international community in, to act in, those, in that, in, in, in a certain manner. 
because that that's that's the way we should think i think because just thinking that uh, okay we'll have the judgments but then we the prospect of implementation the actual judgments which means that the actual payment of the just satisfactions for example that might be might, might be delayed but Yes, that might be delayed or that might be very long years, but I think still having those judgments will be should be used by army and I think that's, that's one of the key aspects that we should concentrate on. Thank you. So in a, in a best case scenario, if, if you can give us an example, how does the enforcement work when all parties involved essentially agree to the judgment and to enforce the judgment? The best case scenario is um, depending on the nature of the judgment, of course, there. if you are speaking about the European Court of Human Rights judgments, you have specific individual measures. That means that the payment of the just satisfaction for the breach, it means that you have the list of the victims that are victims of violations of certain articles. It can be Article 2, 3, or a right to property, and you calculate those, and the court gives a judgment. Based on the judgment, you pay the just satisfaction amounts, and also you may have some general measure requirements, which means that you need to conduct some maybe legislative changes or some other institutional changes inside a country to prevent such violations from happening in the future. That's the best case scenario. And that's, that's, that's being done through the reporting system to the Committee of Ministers. That's very easy. If it's a nice or no, Western European country, <laughs> which is abiding, or it's Armenia, because by the way, Armenia's records are quite good in this regard. I mean, the implementation of the European Court of Ju uh, Judgments, but still, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your work. I was curious, um, so it seems like you uh, answered the standing issue for Garbach. So just was curious how that happened, because it's not a recognized entity. So technically, they don't have standing in one of the international courts. But something changed recently, and I, I kind of lost track of what that was, frankly. I'd like you to maybe uh, just go over that for us. The other thing is, um, what about the verification agencies that are out there, like Amnesty International or the Red Cross? I, I think they're being prevented from actually entering the countries. But I'm just curious as to what verification methods are being used you know, in this day and age. And um, if you could just uh, emblazon some of those sure. issues. Sure. So yeah. the two questions, one is about the standing of, of ARTSA internationally in, in international law, yes? And the second is about uh, verification mm -hmm. agencies. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, the standing issue, uh, it, it, if we are speaking about the cases that are being pending at the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, those cases have been brought by the Republic of Armenia, not Artsakh. Uh, the Republic of Armenia is the subject who, which has the standing to bring the cases based on the treaties that I've mentioned. It doesn't matter, yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the Armenia still has standing to bring claim under the European Convention of Human Rights. And even though they were in Artsakh or they were in Azerbaijan, still we have a standing as a member state of the convention. And Azerbaijan is a member state too. They have obligations under the convention. And we as a member state, under the provisions of the convention, we do have the right to bring those claims. And there are even, even it can be just being a, uh, uh, just uh, 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 even it cannot be Armenia, it can be, for example, Cyprus, who can bring a claim in protection of the rights of those victims. That can be the case, for example. And relating to the verification agencies or verification efforts, yes, it's true that if uh, there are this, the, the, the work of these uh, organizations, meaning non governmental organizations, for example, who are dealing with human rights. That includes Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, which conducts fact, uh, fact collection and data collection and evidentiary collection and analysis and conclusion works. It's important in the phase of uh, in the phase of judicial proceedings too. Why? Because first of all, this is uh, the credible value and the evidentiary value of the reports is higher. 
because it is an impartial agency, it is an impartial organization, it's not, for example, an Armenian organization. And we do use the reports provided by those organizations. They are coming, they are visiting, they have been visiting Artsakh, they have been visiting Armenia, they have been conducting surveys, both Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, and some other organizations. And uh, we're trying also to uh, make available all the resources that they come. And ICRC is a bit different because ICRC is not uh, issuing reports or not issuing any assessments. ICRC is, uh, in, they, they act impartially, they act very strict rules and they just make available the communication between, for example, the POWs and their families. Even they don't share that much of information with the governments. They try to be very, um, very, uh, let's say, neutral in these terms. That's one of the basic principles that ICRC is functioning on. But yeah, that's the main, uh, that's the way I would answer it. Thank you. Thanks. How helpful are observations by, uh, like the World Council of Churches? They are very helpful. Because recently, Archbishop Baikajian cited over 200 POWs were being held. They are very helpful, but uh, they are, but, uh, you mean you mean with regard to the POWs or number of the POWs? Uh, in that regard, uh, the work of the IS ICRC is more relevant because they have the primary source of information. They are the holders of the primary information, and uh, the work of the both parties because they are exchanging information that would be more relevant here. There was a question here, and then there's a question on Zoom. Yes, sir. So, uh, shifting gears a bit, uh, I understand you're well connected with your prime minister. Uh, as we all know, Nancy Pelosi and her entourage just visited uh, Armenia. Uh, I appreciate very much what you're doing, which is, you know, uh, making a case based on uh, legal scholarship. Uh, but a lot of this is also emotional. So, um, to the extent that you can share something with us, uh, what does Pelosi know about this uh, uh, situation with the torture, you know. So the question regards uh, Speaker Pelosi's recent visit and what her level of knowledge is about the situation that, that's under discussion here. I think that during her visit she, she was very well briefed uh, and I also had the opportunity to uh, meet her and I myself also provided a very detailed brief of what's happening quickly, especially relating to the recent uh, events and recent captives and mistreatment, torture and other human treatment. They are aware. They are quite aware. I think they have been reported not only, I think they, it's not only uh, us, but I think it's most of these uh, violations are publicly available, unfortunately or fortunately, and also through other sources. But it's not, Stopping here, I myself will be uh, updating through our embassy uh, here, providing necessary evidentiary materials. A question from one of our online viewers. Uh, condemnation is important. However, how is that relevant to the current existential crisis of Armenia? With the current situation, will you continue to have thousands or more cases to seek legal condemnation for? Uh, and uh, I'll stop there. That's that's probably the main legal question uh, the, here. Uh, yeah, I understand, but the legal proceedings are a bit, they have a diff bit different purpose. They don't serve the purpose of immediate impact uh, on the crisis resolution. Unfortunately, that's the case. Legal proceedings are more far-reaching uh, efforts, and I think uh, we need to be patient here. They are, and uh, they might have immediate impact. We witnessed that, for example, during the hearings. Uh, when uh, we were requesting the court to order Azerbaijan to close down the military to office park. Uh, we, before, the, before the order came out during the hearings, we heard Azerbaijan um, make an announcement and commitment to close down, to not to close down, but they removed the uh, mannequins of Armenian soldiers and the helmets of fallen soldiers. Just a very small brief example that can have some immediate impact. It depends on the scenarios. Of course, this is not satisfactory. We uh, we declared that too, but still, it is some impact. But generally, legal proceedings are lengthy, and they require time. 
They require a lot of effort because you are providing evidence. Evidence should be studied. Evidence should be assessed. Then it takes time. So I think legal proceedings are, have a bit different purpose. I'm not going to ask our speaker uh, about questions about Armenia's capacity to defend itself militarily unless he really wishes to uh, speak to such points. Uh, a, a question that's not necessarily a legal question, but I suppose it, it, it affects what you are trying to do. Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with or address or do you the tendency towards uh, both, both siderism that exists in, in particular, certainly in, in the West, in, in the media, uh, which suggests that these are two sides that hate each other and this is a deep ethnic hatred and they're just both basically on the same uh, footing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the, one of the hardest parts maybe of the work that we do, but uh, I think uh, the only way for me since I'm dealing with legal proceedings. The only way for me to fight this both sides is through providing uh, sufficient evidence, and that's the only way I can I can beat the both sides with the more evidence or or convincing evidence, which we have and we have been providing. Especially, for example, I would say that in the case of uh, uh, based on the third the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, I don't think that, uh, both, both, that there, there is any both sides by the court because the courts, the, the, the evidence was so overwhelming that the orders that came out, they, they also, the Azerbaijan also applied for interim uh, provisional measures against us, and we did too, but if you look at the orders, like there is no, and there's evidently no both sides because it's, very convincing evidence that has been provided for the analysis to the court. You have to make the case so convincing that uh, you leave very slim chance for the court mm -hmm. to, uh, or no, make that. Yes, Adam. Hi, Adam Azarian. Uh, congratulate you for this monumental effort. This is uh, quite an achievement for us. Uh, I wanted to kind of uh, juxtapose a little bit uh, with uh, as someone who's dedicated his career to defend the rights of Armenians and our dignity. Uh, what's happening outside, we all aware of. But if you look inside the Armenia at the moment, we have uh, we have seem to have a boundless fund of police forces with a variety of beret colors that you know beat people up, you know do all kinds of violence. You know we have a number of our opposition uh, people that are in prison. They they have died uh, during uh, you know while in cap uh, you know captivity and. Uh, so how do you juxtapose what we see from our enemies versus inside our country uh, by our own uh, law enforcement forces in the way that they behave? Uh, they treat Armenian citizens, you know, dragging the parents of uh, our fallen soldiers to get up and, you know, viciously attacking our uh, citizens uh, on the streets for their right to protest. So how do you juxtapose these two uh, scenarios that we're dealing with at the same time? Uh, so the question relates to some of the uh, abuses uh, or, or, or uh, brutality that that may be, that's been carried out in, being carried out in Armenia by security forces against Armenian citizens, correct? Okay. And and the relationship to this legal proceeding, or not? I I, I I don't think there is any relationship between those two. Uh, I, I understand that there. are issues internally, they might be in human rights issues internally, that's true, I don't deny that. This uh, and some... Asking for relationship, on how do you juxtapose these two together that's sort of our, our nation is dealing with, uh, they turn on from them externally at the same time, I'm not saying they're related, but... <laughs> Still, I, 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 I do, I conduct my work, I can say that, because I, I think in, 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 irrespective of what's happening inside a country, I think it's highly crucial and important to keep on going in internationally. I think it's, for me, for me, that, that that's the way I think, because it doesn't matter for me at this point. At some point, maybe, but I think it's, it's uh, for what, what, what is being done outside the country to protect the interests of the country, especially relating to relations or no, with Azerbaijan or in legal proceedings, uh, I think you, have to pr continue doing that. I don't know. I don't know how to answer. I'm really sorry. 
A question from online, is the concept of national self-determination germane for confronting state-sponsored ethnic discrimination? Uh, remain? Uh, national uh, self-determination. Yeah. Germane, relevant. Does, it, does that enter into this discussion? Yes, it does. Of course it does. It, it, I think it's always uh, relevant. It's now it's even more relevant than before. I would say that. The self-determination of and equal rights of peoples which is the name of that principle, which is enshrined in the UN Charter. It is relevant. I think it should, be re it should remain re uh, relevant and in, in all the forms of that principle, which includes uh, also remedial cessation, the idea of remedial cessation, which is the extreme way of exercising that right, I think right to self-determination. And I think in the context that we're speaking, I think in a context of the existential threat, that's more than legally justified. And, and is I the would issue say of that remedial secession something that's still being discussed there? I know there had been talk about it more before the war, uh, and the war seems to have changed obviously uh, the discussion. Maybe, but I think it should be discussed. That's my position, because it, it is highly important. In, and now, in, in the context of these legal proceedings that I have described, it's, been, it's becoming even more important, I know, because there is this existential threat. Anna? Um, there is ample evidence of political um, study scholarship on small states that small states should engage in normative entrepreneurship, which is exactly what you're doing. So thank you very much for all the work that you and your colleagues are doing. The question I have is if you could comment as to uh, whether the war in Ukraine has made your, in which way it affected your work? Did it make maybe Armenian claims a little bit more legible to the international court and, and regional court system? In which way did it affect you in any way? And number two, um, politics surrounding international criminal court. Um, what's our position? Is there any rethinking on that? Um, an update on that? So the question one is about the impact of the war in Ukraine on, on this situation. And the second is on the politics around the yeah. international criminal court. Uh, maybe uh, re relating to the question on Ukraine, how that impacted, do I understand it correctly, how that it impacted the legal proceedings overall? Did it make it easier for you or harder to make the claims because there were crimes committed in both cases? Yeah. Uh, Ukraine is actively engaged domestically prosecuted them. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, we, uh, although we submitted our claims uh, before the events unfolded in Ukraine, uh, we, we, uh, the hearings that uh, the ICJ were in October uh, 2021, but still today, uh, I think, I don't think that it impacts directly somehow. I don't see any, uh, any impact there, maybe, uh, which I don't see yet, but uh, uh, I, I see that there is a lot of attention on, on the Ukraine now. The world is highly concentrated on Ukraine. It might be somehow negatively impacting our case, which makes like a little bit takes away the necessary attention that we need to our case. That's one thing that I would say, because uh, you remember the Ukraine's application to the International Court of Justice, and the reaction of the court was immediate almost, like uh, the court reacted immediately based on the Genocide Convention. I don't complain, but I'm just saying that it might be that case. But in, in other terms, uh, it also can play the other way around too, by the way, which means that uh, um, the small states using international law also, it's, if you look at the map, on the map uh, of, post, uh, of, of the former Soviet Union now, uh, the states that have are actively trying to engage with international legal tools are Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia. It's a good, interesting pattern that you see there. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. ICC? Yeah, ICC is, uh, uh, the, the, the situation with the ICC is the following. ICC, um, 
we we have signed the ICC statute. You know, we have signed uh, in back in 1999, uh, October first. Uh, but we have a constitutional court decision uh, back in 2004 when the court recognized the uh, statute as unconstitutional on two grounds. The first ground was that uh, the principle of complementarity, which says basically that when the internal judicial bodies are unable or unwilling to prosecute, then the ICC uh, kicks in. Uh, that's unconstitutional, according to the courts, because our judicial system cannot be complemented with another judicial body. The second aspect was relating to the rights of the sentenced persons uh, to be uh, subject to amnesties and pardons. But this is a bit uh, now complicated. Why? Because especially the second part, because there are two important factors that we need to consider. Uh, the decision of the Constitutional Court was uh, back in 2004. After that decision, we amended our constitution twice. And I think what I'm trying to, what I'm implying is that we can now seriously consider ratifying the statute. I personally believe that being part of the ICC statute would add up an additional layer of protection for Armenia now, because I truly believe that's important and I truly believe that uh, that should be the case. And uh, secondly, relating to the rights of the detained, uh, or rights of the sentenced persons to be pardoned or amnestied is a bit problematic because uh, today's we adopted a new criminal code recently and the new criminal code entered into force on July 1st this year. And according to that criminal code, uh, the uh, person cannot be amnestied or pardoned for the crimes, crimes or for the crime subject matter jurisdiction of the ICC. So this is an interesting development too. And which means that if so, the, the, it means that there is this there is a policy change inside the country, and you need to we need to consider that. And just so we don't get lost in, in abbreviations and acronyms, yes, ICC International Criminal Court. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Baka, yes. I have one question. I mean. How deeply involved was Turkey in the attack on the Armenians? Since mainly the only thing, reason we lost was because we couldn't react to the drones. How deeply were they involved? And why were they allowed? Why, why did NATO allow this to happen? If NATO, is, Turkey was the part of NATO. NATO is not, <laughs> unfortunately, or fortunately, or not. But yes, Turkey's, Turkey was involved directly. Uh, and Turkey's involvement, uh, I think, is quite, even they're not hiding that. They are openly admitting that they are involved. They are both sides, I mean, both Azerbaijan and Turkey, the political leadership, military leadership there, announcing it every day that uh, they are helping their brothers, and it includes uh, direct military involvement, it includes decision-making involvement, it includes also mercenaries involvement, which uh, were recruited and financed and transferred from by Turkey to Azerbaijan. And on that, on that regard, uh, Armenia has uh, filed a case against Turkey in 2021 May relating to that involvement of Turkey, because we filed a case uh, against Turkey uh, claiming that Turkey also should be held account accountable for the violations during the wartime and in the aftermath of the time because they have been involved. And they also, there are mercenaries being used by Turkey. So, yes. But with, with regard to NATO, I don't know. I, I can't answer. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, that addresses also one of the questions from okay. online regarding the enlistment of, of mercenaries. Thank okay. you for touching on that. Stefan. Um, short questions. One is, uh, the contrast between the 44-day war and the current aggression, yes. one of the contrasts is that the world was neutral mm -hmm. in, in the 44th day. Everybody talked parity. Both sides need to calm down, etc. For the first time, we have overt statements 
of Azerbaijan being the aggressor. We know there's political capital in that. Is there legal capital in that? Will that help? Or is it a, a, a non-factor since the evidence speaks for itself? The second question is maybe rhetorical. The work you're doing gives Armenians hope. And I wish there was a way to make it more visible. Okay. There's a perception, especially in the diaspora, that Armenia is weak, is cautious, is subordinated, is afraid. These, uh, the work you're doing is uh, assertive. And this is, a, this is an important behavioral characteristic for Armenians to get over their self-esteem issues politically. So I wish there was a way to, I, I hope there's a way, more visible through all the international organizations in the Armenian diaspora okay. so that our people can be uplifted by the work you're doing. Because it is okay. uplifting. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to attempt to summarize that, but I'm going to let you answer instead. <laughs> yeah, the first question relating to the contrast between the 44-day war and the recent aggression in regard, of, in regard to like the statements of states. And of course, during the 44-day war, we were hearing mostly uh, the parity, like the both sides need to go back to the negotiating table. Now we are hearing more uh, more addressed statements towards blaming Azerbaijan's aggression against Armenia. Of course, there are reasons for that. I know, I understand which, what are the reasons, and maybe also it is. Um, but uh, legally speaking, uh, uh, it, if we are speaking about the violations of happening. Uh, in the context of the European Court of Human Rights, um, it doesn't necessarily add up anything because still the violation is a violation. If it's a mutilation or it's a killing of a civilian or beheading or if it's a racist statement or it's racial discrimination, still are, they are the same. But I think this is more important politically. And uh, politically, it is important that the tone is, being, is changing. It means that the uh, stance or the approach of the international community is shifting or it or shifted because something changed in the reaction. And which also means that we need to be very careful in here and we need to be, I mean me, we, I mean Armenia. Armenia needs to be, uh, to build on that, not to lose the momentum too. That's, that, that's, the, that's the important and nuanced thing. And, and I also, I personally believe that the reason uh, that the world was most more or less silent during the 44-day war. There is a reason for that. It's not without reason. I think we lost opportunities of, in the past decades to work in that regard in order to not make the world speak. That's, uh, that's, that's what I think because uh, you, we lost the opportunity of proving that we're right, or I think we lost the opportunity of proving that our position was legally sound, or our position was uh, uh, was not baseless. And that's that. And I don't want to speak more, but I'll stop here. We can discuss it later. But relating to the other part, yes, we can do that. Uh, thank you for your words, of course, but. Uh, to the extent it's possible, I can do that. But it, there are some boundaries that I cannot cross. But yes, I will do that. Because uh, we are trying to work on that, but I, I know that there is a lot to do still in regard, with regard to the messaging and st stuff. Is Thank your you. Work a matter of public record? Uh, yes. Yes, 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 it is. As soon as, as, soon as the, uh, yes, as soon as the filing is done, then I can publicly speak about that. But before that, of course, I can't. Yeah, yeah sure. There's a question on Zoom from, uh, regarding the, the matter of remedial secession. Okay. Uh, if, you're, if you sure. can tackle that. Let's, what let's would the that. steps towards achieving remedial secession look like? What kind of a process is it legally? There is no process describing the procedure of legal uh, remedial secession, unfortunately. And the problem with the remedial secession is the, world, the, the term itself. The term itself is a little bit misleading. Mm. It is misleading, and the, the concept of remedial secession has been quite a lot disputed in the legal doctrine and the legal scholarship too. It's a new concept. 
It's, uh, uh, and uh, it has been coined maybe in the past couple of decades. And uh, I think the um, one of the, uh, and it has been coined first time for the first time in the framework of the Kosovo advisor hearing, uh, opinion hearings. And one of the countries which uh, started to use this concept, not exactly the way uh, you phrased, phrased it, I mean remedial succession, but remedial self-determination, that was UK. And the UK's brief submitted to the court in the, in the framework of that proceedings, they used that phrase and they um, uh, accepted the existence legally of that principle, of that way of self-determination, let's put it in that way, because that's more correct legally. And uh, there are other countries which also use that term, including, for example, Russia, uh, Germany, uh, uh, France, and I think uh, the, the idea, what I'm trying to explain, the idea of external self-determination, if we put it in that matter, it's uh, rooted in the documents of the United Nations. It's rooted not only, it's especially elaborated in the 1970 Declaration of the Principles of International Law. If you look into there, try to unpack it, you see uh, also the solutions and the answers of very, very, very actively discussed the seeming contradiction between territorial integrity and self-determination, which doesn't exist. And if you have a proven case of self-determination, which should be external, for example, then you you have the resolution for the territorial integrity principle too. And the other way around, though, by by the way, that's. Uh, this, this, this tension or this legal tension, seeming legal tension, was also resolved in the advisory opinion by, by the court in Kosovo case, where the court uh, differentiated legally these two principles, describing that the territorial integrity principle is a principle which is, um, is an element of non-use of force principle, which is enshrined in the UN Charter, Article 2.4. That's where it is. It's not a separate existing principle. It's a part of the use of non-use of force principle. We should emphasize that. That it, it's not an independently existing principle per se. What does it mean? It means that that principle creates obligations only for member states of the United Nations. That the court said explicitly, not the seceding nations, not the seceding people. That's important to highlight. And um, which means that there is no any legal contradiction here too. I, I, I will describe, I, I would talk more because there is a lot of uh, content in the article and in the, in the provisions of 1970 declaration because you have this so-called safeguard clause which also speaks about the possibilities of secession in cases and uh, when, uh, and, and, and the resolution with the principle of uh, territorial integrity and also there's the case case law which is describing the parameters when uh, an, a, a unit of people can secede. One of them, famous case, Quebec case, which although it's a national court, is a Supreme Court of Canada, but still that court gave a very good summary of the legal requirements when you can or cannot secede. And uh, sp especially one of the, um, uh, and the, the requirements that you need to fulfill in order to be able to secede is the uh, existential threat that needs to be there. I think that's the one of the one of the key requirements which I think is evidently it seems to be yeah, seems to be more than more than that. Yeah. This is in, this is very brief. So I don't want to go into legal details anymore. Thank I think you. I'll bore the audience. That's what they signed up for. Uh, so, well, let, let's uh, let me end on that note, and and uh, I want to thank everyone here uh, and everyone watching uh, wherever wherever you are uh, for for spending some time uh, hearing about this. It's complicated for those of us who are not lawyers. Uh, perhaps it's complicated for those of us who are lawyers too. <laughs> But uh, nonetheless, it's, it's extremely important uh, that we be aware of this, and I agree with Stepan uh, that there needs to be much more awareness of, of this work that's being done, and, and you know, it's not going to 
solve any of our problems uh, tomorrow, but it's nonetheless an important foundation that, that's, being, that's being laid down here, hopefully for, for future uh, redress of, of, these, of these crimes. So thank you, and, and uh, thank you for thank sharing you. your time. With us. I wish you good evening. We should wait. Oh yeah, we should. All Please. Right. So what have you there? This is the this is actually the copy of the application on the request for provisional measures filed by Armenia at the International Court of Justice on the sixteenth uh, of September, twenty twenty one. Great. So, we will. Panic. Yes. Happy to have it. Have it, have, it, have it in our library. Is this on, available online as well? It is available online on the court's website. That's uh, the bilingual version, French Great. and uh, English, the official languages of the court. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.